All right, computer vision basics, here we go. This is the second lecture which is gonna introduce feature engineering, the thought process, the vocabulary of an important subfield of machine learning. The first one was all the text stuff we did for SMS spam. Now we're gonna get into computer vision basics at about the same level. And just to say it up front, this stuff is the way you would do computer vision 10 years ago. Or, you know, if you have a certain constrained space that you're getting into, modern computer vision is very much about neural networks. But the reason we're going to go through and start from here is that we'll end up with neural networks and then you'll understand why. You'll see what the pieces of the neural network are doing and you'll map it back to the concepts we're going to learn in this lecture. So we talked about classification, regression, probability estimation, when we were talking about sort of generic classification or generic machine learning or what types of predictions of machine. Ah, let's just do it one more time. We talked about classification, probability estimation, regression in a general sense. And we said, well, what types of things can a machine learning algorithm do? In the computer vision space, there are three slightly different concepts, which somehow encompass those, but project them onto the types of things you might want to do with an image. And these are called classification, localization, and segmentation. I'm going to briefly describe what these are. Classification is, <laughs> you bet it's classification just like, you know, you want to predict a label, look at this image and say, what's in that image? It's a cat, look at that image, what's in that image? It's a dog or it's grass or it's something along those lines. Classification, so it's very much like y equals zero or one. Um, in this case, you might want to classify that the eyes in this image are closed and the eyes in this image are open. One difference between what we've been talking about before, you know, we always sort of said, hey, there's a small number of class labels. Computer vision, there can actually be quite a large number of class labels when you want to look at an image and say like, well, what the heck is going on here? You could have thousands of class labels. I think some of the modern benchmarks where um, machine learning has been reaching human level performance have been with thousands of class labels. So it's not, it, it's the same as what we've been talking about before, but in a slightly different setting with a little bit more complexity. For the assignment, we're going to have a problem that looks like this. These, these uh, data points are drawn from the assignment, uh, module three stuff, and it's going to be a kind of zoomed in eye and you're going to have to predict is the eye in the image closed or is the eye in the image open? Every image in your training set is going to have an eye. It's going to be in one of these two states. And so how the heck are we going to turn this into feature vectors to allow us to make this prediction? By the end of this lecture, you'll have a good shot. You'll have the toolkit you'd need to give it a start. Probably not do as well as you do with like neural networks, but get a lot farther than you might imagine. Anyway, that's classification for computer vision. Localization is a different problem. And in localization, you sort of know what's in the image, but you want to find important points about what's in the image. In this case, you could see, well, here's a face, but what I want to do is like find a mask of the face, figure out what the orientation of the face is, figure out like, is the mouth like this, or like, you know, what, what's going on with the face. And localization is often a precursor to other processing that you're going to want to do to you know, find important parts of the face and then use information about what's going on in the important parts of the face to make downstream decisions. We'll talk through that in a good amount of detail in one of the design pattern talks. I think it's coming up next week, something along those lines. But anyway, in this case, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you, you would input a image that you are pretty darn sure there's a face in and the output of the model would be the x, y coordinates of these nine important points. Or you could, you know, do a localization. You could have nine models, each of which are trying to localize for one of these things. Um, how would you translate between a classification and a localization? Well, you could take this sub image and tile it up into little overlapping pieces. And in each of these pieces have a classifier that says, hey, is there the right corner of a right human eye in this little sub piece that I'm looking at now, right? So then you could, you could kind of have a probability estimate over the whole image of where the right corner of the right eye is. And then at a slightly higher level, you might do a constraint satisfaction to say like, yeah, this point of this eye is definitely this direction from that corner of that eye. And, and, you know, among all the probabilities that all your models output come up with a reasonable mapping to something that like is anatomically what a human face could look like. That's a brief overview of localization. That's probably all we're going to talk about it. 
here's an example of what localization would look like on the data set that we're going to be training on. We won't do that problem, but it's something that maybe we could do in a future year. Now, the third type of predictions in computer vision is segmentation. And here you want to look at an image and say, among all the pixels in this image, which pixels belong to a cat? Or conversely, which pixels belong to a non-cat? So it's like taking, like looking at my outline here, right? Like <laughs> to some sense, the um, green screening software is doing segmentation on me. Is it looking at the video feed and saying, where is human, where is not human? Or where is like foreground versus the green background that I need to remove? And, you know, using a green keyed screen behind me makes it a simpler problem and you don't need fancy computer vision. But if you see fancy computer vision that's doing that kind of effect without a green screen and perfect lighting, that's because it's doing some kind of segmentation. Again, here's an example in the problem space that we'll be working on. You have this whole image and, and this is the skin around the eye and this is actually the eye. So you could imagine doing segmentation also by passing a little classification along on windows and saying, well, is there any part of a cat in this, in this little region? Or, you know, in the, you could run it for each pixel and say, let's look at a window around each pixel and say, does that part of a cat? I don't know. And then from that, you could get from a classification to a segmentation. Of course, that's probably not how you do it. I'm just giving you um, a simple thought process for like, how could these things possibly work? Um, and again, this is about all we're going to talk about segmentation. I mean, we're not going to be doing it in the assignment, but these are important words for you to know. So when you talk to people in computer vision, you have some basic sense of what they're saying. And just like in the text space where you had tokens and words, you know, and you had to take tokens and normalize them and get them all the way to the point where you could input them into a machine learning algorithm, in computer vision, you have pixels. And so we need to start at the raw pixels so you see how those get into a model in a way that allows you to make a meaningful prediction. So this is an example of a grayscale image. Uh, you got a pixel with a white, you have a bunch of pixels that are black and like along the diagonal, there's some gray stuff. Now, the encoding that you would traditionally use for this, so there's lots of encodings for images and it can get quite confusing, but let's just say that with the libraries that we have, we can get it to an encoding where there's eight bits per pixel um, and uh, 255 corresponds to white. So that the value of the pixel is corresponding to how bright the pixel is. So the pixels that have zero are like these black pixels. A gray pixel is some value between 255 and zero. And so that is a simple encoding and it's very easy to get from an image on disk to a two-dimensional array that has this sort of encoding. Now, we've talked about normalization. You might normalize this to a zero one with intensities. That just makes it easier because you know these higher numbers, 255, 128, it can confuse stuff. So you'll commonly do some normalization. We'll look a little bit later into even slightly more advanced normalization that you might try to do with images. But for now, you can get to some point like that. That is grayscale. Just a quick refresher. Color is a three channel image. There's one channel for red, which works pretty much exactly like the grayscale, where a higher value means more red. Uh, but then you have parallel two-dimensional arrays where you have the uh, green channel and then you'll have the blue channel. Um, so you could see like this upper left point there is 255 in the red channel, 255 in the green channel, 255 in the blue channel. And so by adding up these colors, these primary colors, you can get to white, you can get to gray, you can get to like representing many, many, many colors. So there's a little bit more processing that you have to do if you're starting with a color image to get to, you know, this is a, this isn't exactly where we're start, but if you'd say, well, once I get there, the downstream techniques will help me complete uh, what we need to do. So basically you can take these channels and convert them into an intensity normalized array similar to this one. And here's one way that you could do it. You take the red channel, multiply it by point to one, you take the green channel, multiply it by 0.72, you take the blue channel, multiply it by 0.07, then you, you divide it by 255. And so, you know, these things sum up to one, so you end up with a value between zero and one. And this formula that I have down here um, is known to match 
how the human eye perceives things. So this is a useful way to take a color image and turn it into a grayscale image that the human eye will be like, yeah, those are the same image, one just doesn't have color. And it's because of, I don't know what, the photons or the rods and the cones or whatever's in an eyeball. That's why that is. Um, these parameters don't have to have these values. And this is an example of when we get into neural networks a little bit, you'll see that um, you could learn these parameters also. You don't need to just have fixed values for them, but, but for, for right now, just say like, hey, you have RGB channels, you wanna convert into grayscale, you don't have a library to do it, this is, this is what you would do. Image basics, step one. Now, image basics, step two, is you do have this two-dimensional array, and this is just really mechanical stuff that may or may not help you in the homework, but I, I wanted to give this quick review. So, um, X goes that way, Y goes that way, zero zeros in the upper left-hand corner. Doesn't exactly seem intuitive, but that's the way images are represented in the libraries that we use the PIL imaging library. Pretty sure, quite sure, sort of sure, very sure. Anyway, I think that's how that works. Um, and so you can say from PIL import image and then open the actual file path. And that gives you an image object. And then from there you can get pixels, get, get the value at one, one, that would be this one. And then you'd have to divide it by the 255 to get it to that zero one intensity. And that would be the way that you could go from an, from an image, iterate across it and produce that array that we just talked about, which is the normalized array of values. But don't do that, never do that. That's way too slow. Turns out that in PIL, and it, this is kind of common in um, images, there's, there's lots of different formats. So when you index an image, there's often a decoding process, um, moving stuff into memory, um, you know, changing the representation from the number of whatever, I don't know, GIF to whatever. So often you wanna do a step before calling these get pixels, which is essentially tell the image, hey, copy yourself into a known format in an array of memory so I can access you quickly. So you'd think of it something like this, you would sort of unfold this two dimensional thing into a one dimensional thing where the indexes you know, you, you go for the, you do the first row, then the second row, then the third row. So there's the first row, then there's the second row, then there's the third row, right? And this is what that looks like in code. You'd say from the image library import image, you open it the same way you opened it before, but now you, you just load the image into this pixel structure. And I think this is probably hiding a few things behind the scenes, which will be done for you in the, in the framework code that's provided. But now you can access pixels in this form and it'll be like a hundred times faster than doing it the other way, 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 way faster. Anyway, just a simple trick about working with raw image data. Let's move on. Right. So now you know how to open a file, you know how to convert it into an array, but usually in a computer vision, um, project, there's a whole pipeline of processes that you do to go from the images you have to the subtask that you want to do your classification or localization or whatever on segmentations, the third one, you thought I didn't remember. I totally remembered. Um, for the case of module three's homework assignment, I'm gonna give you a example of probably what the pipeline looks like so that you just get a sense of what's going on behind the scenes. Now, first of all, um, to the left of this, there was a, a web crawl process and um, there's a data set called LFW live from the web. It's gone through tons and tons of web pages and extracted faces. Any image that looks like it has a face was extracted and put into this LFW data set. Okay, so an image with a face in it, that's not good enough because we're just trying to tell if your eyes open or closed. So there's a little bit of processing to make your job easier. So you load the image, you probably normalize it. Then you do some localization to be like, okay, where are the points of the face or the faces in this image. And maybe there's something hidden here where you might take a big image that potentially has a lot of faces in it. You might run face detection to find all the faces in the image, sort of localize for faces instead of localizing for face points. And then you might crop around the faces to get to like, it looks like maybe there's somebody standing behind Jesse over there. So maybe there are a bunch of faces, but within that image, you've extracted this Jesse face and that's what you're gonna do. So anyway, then you localize, then you take a crop of the region of interest and that's around the eye. So from this image, 
you know, you have that localization point, you crop one, you crop two. Now you have two training examples potentially. I'm just gonna show this, this one and how this progresses. The next thing you're gonna wanna do is take the image and normalize the size. Now this isn't necessarily totally maybe strictly needed, but it's very, very common to be like, well, if I can get the image to a normalized size, then I'll produce the same number of features for every eye. Right? Like I don't have to, at some point you're gonna have to do a mapping. Let's say you're gonna use decision trees or something like that. You're gonna have to input the same number of features, you know, for every eye. So normalizing for color, normalizing for size gets you in the ballpark where you can start to do that. Then you do the conversions of that normalized eye to the, uh, the intensity array. So take all these 255, zero to 255, whatever, and convert them into zero to one ranges. Now, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the final thing you might consider doing is to further normalize by um, subtracting the mean from everything and then dividing by the standard deviation. The same thing we talked about with looking at uh, numeric features for other cases. That is a useful thing to do here. It'll certainly help using this um, image as an input to a neural network downstream if you have some form of normalization like this. I'll say that these I think the uh, homework starts from here, where you have these normalized 24 by 24 images, the uh, framework code. I don't believe, I may do this, I may not do, I think, oh, there's an option in the feature engineering that I provided to either do the 255 values or to, to normalize it to this point, and I certainly haven't done that. Um, if you were gonna, if we were gonna do an assignment to say, build the best possible eye blink model using, um, you know, boosting, something along those lines, then this you would certainly do. Maybe you won't end up having to do that given the way we're gonna go. Anyway, I just wanted to put it in there so you know what's possibility. Now we have the array. We have seen the process of going from an image up to a particular point. Now we need to go from that point to actual features. And so that's sort of equivalent to in text tokenizing, you have a, a bunch of tokens, then you want to produce features and do um, feature selection. That's kind of the part of the problem we're gonna talk about now in the computer vision space. Um, and there's really three things you need to do. It's kind of one of those menus where you can pick one from each column and you basically, you have to do all three of these things. You define the region that you're gonna process. So it's a subregion of the image. You select the property of that subregion that you're gonna look at. And then you select an aggregation of how do I turn that property from something over you know, a region into something that has a fixed number of features. Now let's look at these each in turn. Define the region. You could extract computer vision features, you know, from the whole image. You could take grids and kind of tile up the image. You could use localization and find a region of interest. Um, and then you could do relative to the points of interest, which are not exactly around it, but you know, you could offset from it, something along those lines. Okay, we're gonna go through that in more detail on the next slide, so let's move on. You could select the property that you wanna use. Now, we've been talking about the intensity, the normalized zero to one value, but another common thing to do, which we'll get to, we'll, you know, there'll be about three slides, four slides about this stuff, but you might say, well, how much does that region respond to a particular image filter? Gradient is one type of image filter. Wavelets is kind of a, slight generalization of it. Convolution is something you might have heard of. And we'll talk about all of these, so I'm not gonna go through them in a lot more detail right now. And then finally, the aggregation. You could take the average, the min-max, or something about histograms. Right? So if you're doing this, you might say, I'm gonna look at the whole image. I'm gonna take gradients with some parameters. We'll talk about what those parameters might be. And then I'm gonna take the maximum gradient across the whole image and that would produce one feature. Or you could take um, the region of interest around the eye, I'm gonna take the intensity, and I'm gonna take the average value of the intensity. Okay, so you, uh, clearly you could make a lot, 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 a lot of features. And then you're gonna have too much and you're gonna have to figure out how to control them. Well, let's start with an example of intensity features. We'll say the region is the whole image, and this is the same sample that we had earlier. The property, like I said, is gonna be intensity. So here are the intensity values for the whole image. So look at the image, compute those intensity values. Now we need to pick the aggregation that we wanna use. And here's some options. Let's say we pick average, min, and max. 
then we would output one feature for the whole image with the average intensity, in this case 0.194, and we'd output one feature with the maximum, which is one, and one with the minimum, which is zero. And so there you go. I mean, we could, their computer vision. Now you know exactly what to do with this. You have three features, learn a logistic regression, see how far you get. Tune the step size, maybe it'll matter. Probably not because this, I mean, right? That's not great features. We're gonna see more and more advanced features that you could do, but this is certainly a start. The next thing that we had talked about as an aggregation is histograms because the average is just like, okay, the average, but it might be important to know that you, there's a big spike of a particular intensity in the image. And so what this histogram says is let's break it up into intensity bins and count how many pixels have the intensity of 0 to 0.2, how many are 0.2 to 0 0.4, 0 0.4 to 0.6, blah, 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 all the way up to fully white. From this histogram, you could see not only is the average of the image dark, but really like 65% of the pixels are dark. And then you have like this small number, small percentage, 10 percentage of the pixels are actually really light. And then to convert this into features, you could have something along these lines. The percent of the pixel mass that falls into each histogram's bucket. This is better, run logistic regression, see how it goes. Ensembles, whatever you wanna do. Now we could do the same thing on a region of interest. You could say, let's look at the middle third of the image. Why would you do this? Because you know that upstream in your pipeline, there's been some localization done. So the middle third of the image is probably like the center of your eye, most likely to contain the iris. Maybe you'd be like, okay, well like, let's throw away these two edges, which are probably containing like the skin and the, the corners of the eyes, which don't help me predict whether the eyes open or close. And let's look right at the iris. Is there an iris there or not? Try these same types of features and you know we could walk through it, but the average is that, the maximum now is that, the minimum is zero still, and we can do the same thing with the histograms. There's really, there's only two values this time, and then you can output those features. That's step two, that's a possibility. Now let's go a little further. In that previous example, we had just worked with the whole image, a little three by three thing, but you could look at the face, the whole image on the face, and that produces eight features, eight intensity features, average min max, the five histogram buckets that we selected. Of course, you know, you could add more things here, but in general, that's where you're at. You could create a regular grid, something along these lines, and you could have eight features from there, eight features from there, eight features from there, eight features from there. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. You'll end up with 32 features. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about feature selection. You could possibly go down from that, find some of them aren't super useful. Okay, that's another thing you could do. The other is that you could create your own region of interest. Um, the previous slide we talked about, you know, taking the middle third, but you could do even better than that. And you could just take like the very center of the image. And so then again, you'd have the eight features, the same features as from the whole image, but maybe more likely to contain relevant information to what you're trying to do, depending on what you know about how the raw image got from the sensor, the wherever it came from to the point where you're trying to do your job. You can do that. And then of course, localization, you could select regions based on their proximity to localization points. Um, in this case, you could take the two eye corners and draw a box that's just a little bit bigger than that. Or, you know, in this case, you could take the mouth points and buffer it by 10% and draw whatever the rectangle there is. So even if the mouth is moving, um, the head is turning, whatever, the features you have are relative to something meaningful in the image. So if you had two pictures of the same person and their head was slightly different, you would be selecting kind of different X, Y values within the image based on this pre-trained machine learning that you happen to have that allows you to make a little bit of progress. Then you can go crazy. Why not do them all? It's only 72 features. That's not so bad, you know, 72 features to try to predict something about this face that might be totally reasonable and um, right. But of course you can do feature selection. One way you could do feature selection is each of these, like here's a region, which is a whole image. Here's four more regions, you know, one, two, three, four, here's another region, one, one, two, three. So you could take all the features from each of these regions and add them or subtract them. So you're doing a region selection, not feature selection per se. And, and you know how to do that with the, they're basically turned into hyperparameters and you can add them to your search, you know, include, include this 
or don't include that and compare the two models and see which one's better. You could do it at the feature level. That's fine. In general, when you're doing uh, the computer vision stuff, in order to use some features from a region, you kind of have to use them all or something like that because the, the code that extracts the features from that, it's probably you, you pass it an image and may, uh, you could do a bit field of like only extract these particular of these sub features, but often by the time you've calculated one of these, you've calculated all of them. So this is a long winded way of saying is that doing feature selection by feature might have a time penalty that makes it, or you know, you, you're not saving time. So you might just want to do it by region and either calculate all the features for the region or none of the features for the region just to make things quicker. And then feature type, you may just like throw out all the averages or throw out all the histograms or something along those lines. Now intensity, raw intensities we talked about, but there's another layer of computer vision, which is a simple step, but very powerful, very, very widely used. And that is to not work with the raw pixels, but work with kind of like responses to changes in raw pixels. And so what I have in this chart shows a particular, let's say, row of an image with all the x locations. So this is x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3. And then I plotted on this axis the uh, pixel intensity. So the pixel at location 0 is totally gray, half on, 128. The pixel at location 5 is fully on, it's totally white. And the one at position 8 is fully off, it's totally black. So you can see that there's an interesting shape here. And something around here is white, and then it gets like super dark over here. There's a giant fall off in the value of that. Those changes are actually potentially interesting. So you can take the gradient of the image in the x direction, and that's defined as, you know, if you're talking about x equals 1, the gradient is the intensity at x plus 1. So at 2 minus the intensity at x minus 1, so 0. So that's kind of like the slope of the line through 1. In this case, the gradient there would be a 0 because the value is the same in front of it and behind it. And you could say, well, you know, that region of the image isn't super interested. There's no contours there at all, nothing to grab onto and um, make a classification based on. Now I plotted the gradients at each point of this image. I've used this axis to plot them. It's a little bit odd, but we just we just calculated this point where we said the gradient was zero. Then um, if we calculated the gradient at this point, we'd see that it is larger at x plus one than it is at x minus one. So the gradient is 0.25. And you would see like there's just this steady flat region of 0.25 gradients where um, it's increasing, but at a consistent rate. Um, and then you get to a pretty fast fall off where the gradient falls all the way down to being a negative one. Let me show you something that hopefully is more intuitive. If this were your input image, it's very dark on the left side, so the intensity is zero, and it's very bright on the right side, so the intensity is one. If we take the gradient across that entire image in the x direction, we would get something like this, where there's no gradient as you're kind of like moving in this direction, then you hit this point where the intensity changes drastically and there's a very large gradient. After that point, the um, gradient goes back and it's zero, 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 zero. So I think what I've plotted here, there'd be two pixels where the absolute value of the gradient is one. Um, the first pixel for the up gradient and the second pixel for the down gradient. Okay, that's one example. Now, if we took the Y gradient, so if we changed these X's to Y's, and swept, it would be like sweeping this image in this direction. And you can see there's no gradient in that direction. Every pixel, as you step through this, the value is the same, the value is the same, the value is the same, no gradient. So the X gradient has some interesting thing, the Y gradient has nothing. Another example, input image. Try to think about what this will look like. Just okay, that's enough thinking. The X gradient, I mean, it just flipped it, right? Like, And then the Y gradient would look like that. Something a little bit more interesting. What about an image like this? What would the X gradient and the Y gradient look like for this? So let's get the X gradient. Let's get the Y gradient. 
pretty much exactly the same because both directions you hit that at the same point and so you get the up gradient and the down gradient at pretty much exactly the same point. Um, now let's take something that looks a little bit more like an eye and be like, well, what gradients might we see from that? So the X direction, you kind of catch the outsides of the ellipse and then the Y direction, you catch something along those lines. Um, let's do something that's actually an eye. If this were the image and you're taking these gradients, the X gradient looks like a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. I When I first did this, I expected that to look a lot more cool than it did. But, you know, there's just a lot of color changes there and there and there and there. And so as you're sweeping it in the X direction, you just get this kind of blah noise. And and I, I do think I um I boosted the in the uh, scale here so it was clearer. I think without that it was just basically very hard to see anything. But the Y gradient is much more interesting. And you can see that there are strong gradients there and there that you know, maybe even one there that are showing up there, there, and maybe even there. And then there's this this other thing up here, which is maybe related to the brow. So the Y gradient in this case, if you were just eyeballing it, you'd say, well, maybe that is a darn good feature for this problem. Um, let's include that. So let's go through how you would do it. Sort of same like what we talked about for intensity. You select your region. Let's say you select the whole image. You could come up with lots and lots of gradient features, but in one example, you might have the average X gradient. So you take the raw image, you convert it to the gradient array of the same size, and then you take the average of the X gradient, the max gradient, the min gradient, and the same histogram things. You can see the, um, you know, most of the gradient values are quite small, but there's some that are quite large. Uh, you could do the same thing in the Y direction. And here the average is higher which is fine, but you could see that maybe, and I don't know, these values don't look like I calculated, maybe I made them up, but you could see that there's a lot more large gradients in the Y direction than there are, you know, and it's a little bit sort of flatter there. So these could be the features that you input to your logistic regression ensemble, whatever it is you're gonna do. You could add them to the intensity features. You could do the regular grid trick, end up with a lot, a lot more features. You could do the region of interest trick, you could probably using localization that might make a lot of sense and then again the combinations so intensities gradients different regions for different ones the search space is getting pretty complicated but we're starting to expose more and more of the structure of what's going on in this image that's relevant to the eye openness or eye closedness of whatever's in the image we're getting somewhere and you might ask yourself why do this localization why find these points and then put in features if you can find these darn points whatever machine learning algorithm did that it could probably do something about the eye like somebody else is probably extracting a whole bunch of features before this problem falls on your lap so why would we ever do this like localize and then do second layers of features and it's because of you can use pre-trained classifiers and the human face is a very highly studied object in computer vision, as you might imagine. There's been work on it for, I guess, like 2001. Um, and let's let's hide me again. This Viola Jones face detector, very widely used. You can find like open CV, open computer vision. You can just load that library and boof, you have a pretty darn good face detector that you can run in an image and it would output regions where there happens to be a face. And this is an example of like, we talked in the tech space of, hey, you can take word to vec and compute words or convert words from their sparse representation to a dense representation. Uh, similarly here, you can take off the shelf components and stitch them together into a higher level computer vision system with much, much less work than having to go back and change the original system. Now, when we talk about the case study, which we're gonna get to pretty soon, like next week or whatever, like about, um, working on a computer vision system like something that might be something I've worked on or maybe not, um, we'll see the pros and cons of doing this and stitching things together. But for now, for this application, like we highly depend on it and we're not gonna go mess with the guts of it. So we'll take whatever outputs it has and then you know add features specific to our task on top of the outputs of that model. And this is behind me, that, that's a link if you wanna find the slides and go read that paper. Right, intensities, gradients, 
convolutions is the third thing I want to talk about. And a convolution is conceptually, and this is a little bit conceptual here. You know, you're going to go to the Wikipedia page and it's all a bunch of math or whatever. But very conceptually, it's a generalization of the concept of the gradients that we just talked about. And so you will, with a convolution, you'll have a filter. And this is an example of a three by three filter. And what this means is that you take the pixel in the center of the filter and you sort of sweep that across the image. Uh, so it would be like when you're at this point here, then you overlay the filter around that center point and you multiply, multiply, you basically do a dot product, the multiply and sum of all of these. So if you think about it similar to our linear models, these are the weights and these are the, the values and you multiply it up and sum and then the output of that sum becomes the value of the feature at that point. So this is an example of taking this filter and sweeping it over this intensity value, you know, if just to really calculate it. So we're calculating this point, which is this value there. And you would take minus one times that, positive one times that, the value is one. So you would output one because everything else that is a filter is a zero. So it doesn't matter what's in the original image at any of those points where there's a zero, you just are gonna output the one over there. And that's how you end up with, you know, I, I guess it's probably a little sloppy to say that's a convolution. It's the operators have very precise names, but you sweep this over this image, end up with the response. And then you take this response and extract features from that, just like we've been talking about for everything else on the previous slides. So why would you do that? This filter here is, pretty much exactly the X gradient we talked about on the previous slide, right? That is that little equation expressed in a matrix that you could do a dot product convolution or something like that with the image and get the response. And that's exactly what's going on here. This filter is equivalent to the simple X gradient we talked about. This filter here is equivalent to the simple Y gradient we talked about. But these things have been found to not be the best at detecting edges. I'm not gonna go into the whole theory of it, but a simple extension of it is called the Sobel edge detector, uh, Sobel gradient, commonly used. Um, there are even more sophisticated versions of it, but in this version, you just use this array instead of this array, and you find much more stable, clear edges, much more useful to do your input features. That's what the um, result of this Sobel X gradient is on the original I, and here's the uh, Y version of it. That looks much smoother. Now we have even more tools. We have the simple gradient. We have this Sobel extension to it that is a little bit more stable. Maybe it'll work better as features for your machine learning. Maybe it won't. Something you could try. I think generally people would just start a little bit closer to this side than to this side because intuition of everybody who's been involved in computer vision, you wouldn't you wouldn't do this. And then you might ask yourself, well, that's cool. That's nice that this guy invented this thing. Has anyone else invented anything useful? <laughs> you betcha. Here are a whole bunch of things that people have invented. And they're, you know, wavelets is a term that you'll hear a lot. I guess Gabor and Har each came up with sets of filters that have been proven to be useful in specific computer vision tasks. You'll have to go do some reading to figure out which ones to use where or whatever. This is uh, probably very much exactly what came from the Viola Jones paper. I don't know if that's where it originated, but it's been found to be very useful in that domain. These are sort of like sine waves, a sine wave with different orientations, like just like starting from here, rotate it, rotate it, rotate it, rotate it, and then kind of like it falls off with some Gaussian smoothing parameter so that really only at the center. And so basically what these would say is take the image that you're trying to make a prediction of and see which of these things it looks like, right? Where, where is it that there's going to be a high response to this filter, to that filter, to this filter, and to that filter? Well, what does that mean? I don't know, but those are the features and your machine learning algorithm will determine how predictive each of these responses are for the eye classification problem and you know the wavelets thing here too and that 
is a lot of techniques that people have been using in computer vision, like this one was 20 years ago. Um, these things, both of these I personally used about 10 years ago. Now you might be asking yourself, well, what about neural networks? Well, neural networks also do something very similar to this. I'm not going to try to explain it all now, but the existence of these filters have come on the back of a lot of humans spending a lot of time working and finding things that tended to work well for their domains or maybe just randomly doing stuff in it. I don't know how they came up with it. I, I don't need to make this up. But the point I'm trying to make is that neural networks can learn the filters for you as they're learning the classification task. And so in that sense, um, neural networks take this concept that we've spent a lot of this lecture building up and elevate it and get one step meta from that. And we're going to show you how to do that, but not in this lecture. And now we're going to get to the summary of basics of computer vision. We talked about prediction types, classification, which you know what it is, localization, which is finding the points of interest, like, like the nose and the corner of the mouth, that kind of stuff. Segmentation, which is a little like what the green screen is doing of cutting out a particular type of object from the background, segmenting it from the background. Uh, generally, when you're doing computer vision, you're going to have some processing pipeline, which takes the raw sensor input, normalizes it for the color, the size, localizes what you're trying to work on for your particular classification task, crops it, converts it to intensity, normalizes, and then gets started with constructing features. So the kind of like the upstream pipeline and then the feature engineering, although they are somehow related and you know they're dependent on each other. In general, you construct features by picking one from each of these categories of regions, like the whole image or grid or you know points of interest, what you want to look at the intensity or response to one of the many different types of filters or gradients that we talked about, and then how you want to aggregate the response. So you're going to take the average, the maximum, whatever it is, histogram, something along those lines. And keep in mind that a lot of modern computer vision is done with neural networks, and we're going to get there. There's at least two more lectures before we start to see that, but we're trying to build up and, and get ourselves there. And I'm looking forward to getting there with you guys. See you next time.